cannot wait to hear all about how you came up with this idea. Thank you so, so much. And thank you for having me. It's it's nice to talk to you. Oh my gosh. Thrillers and just things that get in your head. And when I have to sit and really in my real life am ignoring the people that are talking to me because I'm thinking about the <laughs> characters that I'm more interested in and wondering who's lying and who's being shady and what's motivating what and all of that, it's just the absolute best. So set the, st- set the scene, if you will, uh, for the characters in Things We Do in the Dark. Well, the book opens with a woman uh, whose name is Paris Peralta. She is married to a much older retired celebrity comedian who then at some point decides to unretire and make a comeback. So she wakes up one morning and she discovers Jimmy, her husband, dead in the bathtub, full of blood, and she's holding the straight razor that might have killed him. And the police are in the bathroom and they're there to arrest her. And as she's sitting in the back of the police car, and this is all in the first chapter, so no spoilers, <laughs> she is worried about the murder charge. But what she's worried more about is that people will find out who she actually is. There's a big media frenzy that's happening with Jimmy, with Jimmy's death, and she is terrified that her true identity will be revealed. It's so great when we meet these, when we meet somebody like a Paris because she she's genuinely in love with her husband. So we know we're learning elements about her and who she is at her core, but as the story unfolds and we jump back and forth in timelines and we start to piece things together, I mean she she has an identity that she has separated herself from and and she's got a she's got a do over in this life and she's happy in this life and it's it's great because he's retired and he's out of the spotlight and and they're able to spend time together and she's chill as a yoga instructor and life is good and all of a sudden now um, she's sort of thrust into this uh, arena where people are watching her and now she's a a tabloid news story and she knows that what she's been trying to separate herself from for decades or at least um it is going to um come back to haunt her we're also meeting uh, a a podcast a true crime podcast host who is (laughs) investigating a previous story with some personal connections and so these are sort of parallel stories that the reader is looking to see how they'll all connect um how did you map out this story and then talk to me a little bit about that other portion of our tale (laughs) <laughs> you know, I, I don't know how I mapped it out because I don't write in order. And so when I sat down to write this book, I was sitting beside my son who was in first grade and he was virtual schooling. Oh and so my he's sitting gosh. Beside me. <laughs> he's sitting beside me. The don't dining give room table. me flashbacks. Now I'm starting to sweat in my back. That right? was a very it's, difficult it, time. It was, <laughs> listening to the first grade teacher trying to get the kids to stay engaged. And I'm, you know, a foot away in the next chair trying to write about murder. So that was, <laughs> A weird. I'm writing about um, sex, murder. Uh, wait, what was, was that? A, it was a weird, like, ragey experience to, to write about that. Um, so, but typically, though, I don't outline my novels, and I write the most exciting thing I can imagine that day, um, which is fun for me as a writer because creatively, I always get the instant gratification of writing out a scene that demands to be written, but in the long term. It is a very confusing process because then I end up with a bunch of disjointed um, chapters and timelines and different points of view. And I have to, at some point, stop and go, okay, what am I trying to say? And so this was this was the epitome of that for this book. I got to maybe the 75% mark of finishing the novel, uh, which is basically 75,000 words. And I had no idea what I was trying to say, but I knew that every scene I had written was part of the story. And so the shuffling around to figure out where everything fit, the best way to open the book, which characters have the biggest voices, all of that came about when the book was nearly finished. And then at that point I was like, okay, do I like the structure of this? And then there was more shuffling around. It is not an efficient process, but it's worked so far. Knock on wood, it will keep working. But it's, um, it, it the structure always comes together last. And the opening oh. of the book is usually the last thing that I write. You're That's like a, a mad scientist of fiction. It's not my preference. I envy other writers who are very organized and have their idea very set. They know who, how it's going to end. I never know who it's going to end. I never know who the villain's going to be uh, until I get there. And so 
one of the one of the things I laugh about is when I get a review and they say, "Oh, I guess I guess who this was from the beginning," and I'm like, "Did you? Because I wish you would have told me." <laughs> You could have made it a lot easier on me. I, I didn't, didn't know where know. this was going. I didn't know going. until eight months later. <laughs> wow, that is incredible. Well, first of all, and I think we're just sick people who who read uh, psychological thrillers like this because we're always trying to figure it out. I mean, I guess that's part of the fun. But then, of yeah. course, we we want to make sure at the end we're like, whoa, I was totally caught off guard. And that's the barometer of whether we think yeah. it was great or not. Um, but what you do here is you really just, you created very interesting, very complex characters uh, that you could dig into. Um, and no matter what what twists were coming um, and whether, whether you know, a, a reader might feel like you anticipated one and not the other or what, um, you're you're in this with them, and and you know that there's just there's there's a lot of layers to each and every person who is represented on your pages. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I I've always been a character driven storyteller. I really think that characters dictate where the story goes, especially in a psych thriller where it's all about motivation and behavior. You know, and what you see on the surface isn't necessarily what's happening behind the scenes. And so and I'm fascinated with the idea of every single person having secrets, because I think we all do. And as you know, right, because you're on TV, there's the image you present to the world. And then there's the you when you're at home and no one's looking. Right. And so I'm always fascinated to peel back the curtain and see what is what is that person doing when no one is looking? Who are they really? You know, what are they into? What are the what are the secrets and, and stuff that they don't people know that they would be maybe embarrassed for people to know? And so for Paris, it's it's next level secrets, right? She's not <laughs> what she's hiding is a whole other person, essentially. Um, someone she used to be that she thought she buried and wanted to, you know, reinvent herself. And with the frenzy surrounding Jimmy's death, people are asking questions maybe wondering who she is someone might recognize her from the past so it was really fun to dig into that and it's and there's a lot of themes that you're exploring too it's sort of like um you know are, are our fates sort of predetermined by kind of where we come from or the people that we come from and and what what is the trauma that we've experienced yeah. maybe imprint on on ourselves as human beings even if we think that we are consciously reshaping the future of our own lives i mean what kind of power do we have um to 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 put forth a new path for ourselves, even if we're very intentional about it. Um, and then, it, of course, the themes of of motherhood and of relationships and of celebrity. And, I mean, there's just – and the way that people revolve around somebody who is, is sort of the, the nucleus to, to mm -hmm. a, a world, like – being with somebody like Jimmy, who is, even if he wasn't at the peak of his celebrity when they get together, the way that just everything is around that person, what happens when that gets shaken up? Yes, and all the relationships that he has and everyone having a unique relationship with him, but it's heavily influenced by Jimmy, right? And Jimmy's world and how Jimmy likes to live. And, you know, we're never in Jimmy's point of view in the book, which was a deliberate choice, actually because I wanted the reader to know him through the eyes of the women who loved him and then come up with their own feelings as to whether who knew him best. Did anyone know him at all? Um, and so actually Jimmy was one of my favorite characters, even though he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> he's dead from the first word. <laughs> but we see him a lot in flashback and, and he really had a big presence in my mind. So I'm looking at you and I am also, I'm of course it, it, picturing you as Paris Peralta. So, I mean, I mean, there's, there's gotta be a lot of uh, things that you brought of your own life into uh, both the setting and the description of our protagonist. And it's also one of the things that I really appreciated about, about the book. It, it's amazing. It takes picking up a book and realizing that we're, we're reading about a, in particular, a woman of color and talking about her ethnicity and about some of the stereotypes and perceptions that come along with that to make you realize how most of the fiction I were, were generally re reading about white characters interacting with other white characters. Yeah. yeah, it was, you know, early in my career, I don't know how comfortable I felt writing about someone like me. I wasn't sure that publishers would be interested. Um, so much of what had influenced me as a thriller reader was about white characters <laughs> living white lives. And that's what I had access to. That's what was available to read. 
And it took a little while for me to get to a place where I felt like, you know, I think this is a story people of, you know, any culture, any race would want to be reading about. And at its heart, it's a thriller. Um, if there are social messages to be gained from that, it actually wasn't intentional on my part. It's just, you know, as a woman of Filipino Canadian descent, which I am, and so is Paris, you see the world a certain way and the world sees you a certain way. And so there's no way to write a story, any kind of story, thriller, whatever, without that affecting the character and how she lives her life. So um, it was really the most authentic book I think I've written and it felt the most personal to me because a lot of a lot of her memories, especially of her mom uh, when she first came to Canada is uh, our stories I pulled from um, my mom telling me about her experiences when she first moved to Canada in the 70s. So a lot of that is me remembering what it felt like to realize that you are an other. Because I don't know that I knew I was Filipino until I was in kindergarten and someone mentioned it and was like, oh, what are you? And I'm what do you like, mean? what do you mean, girl? Mean, <laughs> what, what do you mean? And I had to go ask. I had to ask my mom, like, what am I? She's like, well, you're Canadian, you're Filipino, and people will see you that way. And I didn't know until someone else asked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is. And, and, and that is a. Uh... So relatable. And also all, part of what we love about reading is just getting that opportunity to step into somebody else's shoes and see the world through their eyes. And, yes. and, and that's, you know, it have, having a better understanding of, of other I love people. reading about people who aren't me. Exactly. You know, I really do. And I, and I think it's interesting to see their worldview and their opinions on things um, and how they're treated because of how, of who they are, you know, and I, I didn't want to shy away from that in this book, because I really do think it informs everything that happens. There is a profoundly, and I'm being, being very careful to, of course, no spoilers when we're talking about a book, because this is, this is <laughs> a book that everybody's, you, you've got to read this book. Um, the the relationship, uh, observing and experiencing the result of, of a kind of a traumatic, um, harsh uh, or uh, abusive emotionally or physically relationship between a mother and a daughter and what that kind of can do um, to someone. And it was a really, it was really uh, a, a painful journey to explore in the book, um, but really well done. It was like um, kind of shining a light on something that you almost want to, uh, not admit occurs, which would be like the jealousy from a mother um, pointed at her daughter just uh, for looking at at what is a a younger, you know, a a pretty young, you know, still with a future ahead of her version of herself. And that's a really um, complicated, dark kind of emotion that we we don't want to admit, but I imagine is something that that, that plenty of people have wrestled with. I think so. You know, I, all of my girlfriends have different relationships with their mom. I have a relationship with my mom and their mother daughter relationships are really complicated. Um, some mothers and daughters are best friends. Some mothers and daughters don't speak. Some mothers and daughters, there's a lot of criticism, you know, and in this case, I think with Ruby, Ruby being probably in my mind, an undiagnosed narcissist, Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, I imagine she would love Joey, her daughter, Mm -hmm. tremendously, but also be very threatened by Joey because she's used to having all the attention on her. She's used to people noticing her first. Mm -hmm. Uh, And Joey, as she grows up and and looks a lot like her mother, interferes with that Mm -hmm. and interferes with Ruby's agenda, Mm -hmm. you know, because at the end of the day, Ruby is all about Ruby. And I wrote, Ruby's a bad mother. That's, you know, a given, but I wanted specifically to not worry about making her redeemable in any way, because I think there are some people who just are not. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for Ruby, she is, it it, kind of goes back to the old nature versus nurture. Is Ruby like that? Because she had a bad mother, but Ruby has a sister who didn't turn out quite that way. So I just, I think they're complicated. I wanted to explore how much of, of that childhood we would pass down. And is it possible to break a cycle? And I, I think I have some version of that question in every book that I write, and I answer it differently in every book that I write. And so I, you know, without spoiling it, I can't tell you what the answer here is, but I think the reader can definitely interpret whether they think, um, you know, the character managed to survive her childhood, really, you know? Yeah, and, and, and ultimately that is kind of, that is 
the the core of the question of the book. And and I, I was reading uh, a little bit on your our website about as you were discussing uh, your approach to some of your earlier novels and and that encourage and I've he- heard this and read this um, from many authors in particular female authors who say that they get that nudge to write these female characters that are always you know there always has to be something good about them or they can't be too unreliable or too unlikable or too 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 anything um, you know so so basically publishing and fiction mirrors the real world because we're not supposed to be too 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 anything we're supposed to be just the right amount of everything at all times um, um, right. But you 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 reject that and 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 you and I think you have to if you're going to write good good interesting characters. I you know I do reject that and and I I learned that lesson the hard way when I tried to get my first book published and I had taken to heart some feedback that came from a male uh, workshop um, participant who had read my first few pages and basically declared it awful because he was like, no one would read a book about a woman who is a sex addict, which that first book was about who cheats, you know, she's not likable. And I thought, Oh, she's not likable. So I went and I changed it. And nobody wanted to buy that book. The book about the woman who doesn't make mistakes is not a book that people were interested in. Um, but I balance it out because while I want to present women as complicated characters, because we are, and not above making huge mistakes and and having flaws, which we are. I also want them to save themselves. And I don't want this woman to be in a jam or some big gigantic mess that she created and someone else rescues her. So she gets herself into her own messes, but she also gets herself out. And that's a theme of everything that I write because that's what speaks to me. You know, I think that, that women, we often rescue ourselves, whether we get the credit for it or not. Oh, very well said. Um, it give tell me you you already described kind of. I, I can't believe. I feel like there should be no books on the shelves right now coming out of COVID and like the way that our lives changed so much. And I'm just floored by how people were able to still do what they needed to do <laughs> because to me in particular the remote learning was like a disaster <laughs> a disaster be like okay I'd hear I'd hear the teacher say kids does everybody anybody have a question everybody knows what we're doing we're gonna meet back here in 30 minutes everybody's good everybody nod your little heads okay great nod and then click off and he'd say I don't know what we're doing so <laughs> you know like could try to do tv from home like it was just a lot so the fact that you could do this at that time is incredible um in in general, what is your routine for writing? Where are you writing? What time are you writing? Um, you know, what do you, what's going on around you? And, and what advice do you have for somebody who aspires to sit down and, and start trying their hand at fiction? You know, my, my original advice would be, you know, have a ritual, rituals help. And I used to have a very, very consistent ritual where I would write in my office with the door closed. I always wrote at night. I was a nighttime creative person. And I would have a candle burning, I'd have a candle burning and it would smell like some type of food, like apple pie or pumpkin spice or cinnamon. And I would write into the wee hours of the morning until I'd exhausted my brain and it was time to go to sleep. Then I had a kid and suddenly all bets are off and you write when you can, where you can. You try to keep them occupied so you can do your work. And that changed how I wrote. And I resented it for a while because I liked writing when I felt like writing. And then it felt like a job. It was like, okay, I have to write when I have time to write, which is dictated by someone else's schedule now. Um, And then for the pandemic, it was a disaster, really, because there were people in my house talking to me, making noise. I was constantly distracted. I would write in 15, 20 minute chunks if I was lucky. And I would often be interrupted because I would hear the teacher saying, Mox, Mox, I don't see you in front of the computer. And I would look and I would see my son watching Netflix in the next room. (laughs) (laughs) He had wandered away and I didn't notice because I was Mm -hmm. immersed. So my advice to a writer would be, you know, really set a quota for yourself every day. If you can write whatever that is, if it's 500 words and two pages, hit that. And if it takes you all day to hit it in 15 minute chunks, that's completely fine. But any type of consistency that you can create for yourself is a good thing, but it doesn't have to be every day, Mm -hmm. just your own pattern and stick to it. And it's like going to the gym, the more you do it, the easier it gets. And if you've fallen off the wagon for a while, those first few sessions back are painful <laughs> to try to keep it up. <laughs> and, then, and then you end up with a beautiful puzzle that you might be able to link into a very creative novel. 
<laughs> oh my God. Well, that part happened at night. So when I got to the point where I, you know, 75,000 words of, I don't know what I'm trying to say, because I needed more in uninterrupted time to get into the zone, like a creative zone, I I would be up all night writing. That was the only quiet time that I got. And so for last month or, or so of working on this book, I was a vampire. I kept very, very vampire hours. And to push to the finish line, it was a 24-hour writing stretch. What? <laughs> I remember my son coming down at 7 o'clock in the morning, and I'm still sitting in the same spot that I was the day before at 7 o'clock in the morning. And he's like, Mommy, did you even go to sleep? And I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> It has been an entire 24 hours and I have not gone to sleep. And, and, you know, it's pandemic life, you know, that's the adjustment you make. And, and I, you know, in at my age now, that type of staying up is bad. <laughs> <laughs> I needed like three days to feel normal again. You oh, know, definitely. <laughs> Honor the days when you could stay up and, and you know, go to school and party and work two jobs. And- oh. stars and bring- Olivia's book club the podcast I'm your host Olivia Fierro our producer is Margaret Stewart you can send us an email with your thoughts or your book recommendations Olivia's book club at azfamily.com is the address and you can check out Olivia's book club on Facebook or find us on Instagram hello bookstagrammers at Olivia's dot book club and Margaret is at overbooked and overdue Make sure to rate and subscribe to this podcast and tell your friends. You can find us on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Amazon Music.